much time, folks. I wish the eastern sky would cloud up. Lord, come back and split that thing open and get this over with. Amen. I tell you, I'm looking forward to that day, amen, either amen. by the grave or by the rapture of the church. I'm good either way, amen. amen. I'm ready either way. Amen. amen. Brother Barry McDonald, would you open us the word of prayer, please? If you would stand, get your All American Church, and we'll turn to page number 10. Jesus saves. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Declare the news. Jesus, folks. It is all about Him.
Jesus knows our every weakness. Pray to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? Covered with the load of care. seated. I, I'm on the schedule to sing. I might as well just go ahead and do it since my player is sitting over there. I think, uh, i tell you what, folks, I thank God for my church. And I love my church, folks. I love everybody here. And I thank you for for being friends. And, and I thank you for being my church member. And I covet your prayer. Uh, a lot's happened in the last few weeks. Uh, and it just broke my heart. A lot of things that just broke my heart. And uh, I, about 2 o'clock this morning, I was laying, I mean, it's just been rough. But anyway, I got up this morning just tired. And I was like, Lord, what am I going to do? What do I do here? Show me. And I sat around and I moped and went on and prayed some and talked to the Lord. And, and then this part of this verse came to my mind. 1 John 4, 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in the, in the greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. Amen. And then I thought, well, that's that's really good. Thank you, Lord. And, and another one came to me and said, Jer it's Jeremiah 33, 3. He said, call unto me, and I'll answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things thou knowest not. I believe that. The things haven't come to pass yet. But he's going to show great and mighty things. Amen. Amen. He's just faithful that way. Right. Right. And uh, it wasn't long after that until I just, you know, I just dropped my head and started crying. Lord, what I do? You know. And uh, just uh, sit there and went into his cradle and you know he just i'll tell you what it was a good time <laughs> i just i was i was blessed and i thank god for that showing up when you need him showing up when you need him most amen i'm thankful for that you know he's prayer away he's just prayer away and then i was struggling with the song what am i going to sing lord tonight <laughs> Blessed assurance. <laughs> so. <laughs> Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. <laughs> Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. Yeah. Yeah. This is my storm, yes, this is my song, yeah. praising my Savior all the day long. This is my 
my story This is my song Praising my Savior All the day long Perfect submission Perfect delight Visions of rapture Now burst on my side Angels descend Ring from above Echoes of mercy Whispers of love This is my story This is my song Praising my Savior All the day is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long perfect submission all is at rest I in my savior am happy and blessed watching and waiting I'm looking above filled with his goodness <laughs> lost in his love this is my story this is my song my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, folks. Many mornings at two and three and four o'clock in the morning that I've done the same thing as this brother. Amen. When you get older, you think you sleep better. You don't. <laughs> A lot of times I'll get up three o'clock and I won't go back to sleep the rest of the night. So what do you do? I pray. Because the Bible says, he that keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. I've never had to wake him up. He's waking me many times. Amen, amen, amen. Well, good to have all of you with us tonight. It's good to be here. Amen. Uh, if you have your Bible, turn to the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 3, and verse 1. All right. The scripture says, Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, Jerusalem, in Mount Moriah. Notice the connection. Where Jehovah appeared unto David his father in the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of Ornon the Jebusite. Father, bless your word now in thy holy name. Amen. So what is a Jebusite? Go ahead and be seated. We have, we have a lot of different uh, types of folks alive at that time. Joshua chapter number 3 and verse 10 says this. Joshua said, Hereby ye shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Hivites, and the, Bar and the Perizzites, and the Gergesites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. The Jebusites are akin to Canaan, all right? Canaanites. Cursed be Canaan. 
This is what uh, the curse that uh, Noah placed upon one of his sons, his progeny, was Ham. Shem, Ham, and Japheth, three sons of Noah. After the flood, he placed this curse upon the uh, posterity of Ham. And so therefore, from the plains of Shinar, this is where the ark landed on top of Mount Ararat, and the plains of Shinar began, became the area of dispersion. They went forth from Shinar. And the word Japheth means spread out. And that's exactly what the Japhethites did. Spread out. They're everywhere, all over the place, even to the moon. Now, I know a lot of folks don't believe it's the moon. They believe it's a desert out in California somewhere. But I believe they went to the moon. Amen. And, uh, and, uh, and said that Japheth would dwell in the, in the tents of Shem. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. So he lets you know right off the bat that the, not the God of Japheth, he's got plenty of them, or the God of Ham, he's got all kinds of gods, but the God of Shem. The God of Shem. The name Shem in Hebrew means name. That's a remarkable thing. And Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob came from Shem. And blessed be the Lord God of Shem. How do I know I have the right God? I've got the God of the Old Testament. I've got the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. He did not change. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. But he did incarnate himself in human flesh. And the Lord Jesus Christ is God manifest in flesh among us and Christians have always believed that never problem never had a problem with it when you deviate from that you get into heresy so what's a Jebusite well a Jebusite was a thorn in the flesh for the children of Israel as they went in what's called the conquering time or the conquest time and this was with Joshua when he crossed the the, uh, the Jordan River faith first it stayed at the plains of Gilgal there the reproach was uh, rolled away circumcised themselves and we're ready now to talk, to conquer, to go into the land and conquer the land. And the first victim was Jericho when the walls came tumbling down. And on end they went. And Joshua led them from one victory to the other victory to the other victory, so forth and so on. But there was one place they were not able to overthrow once they got into that land, and that was Jerusalem. At that time, it wasn't called Jerusalem. It was called Jebus and, or Salem. And there the Jebusite was in stronghold. If you remember, uh, when Abraham came back from the slaughter of the kings, he met a priest of the Most High God, and his name was Melchizedek. It's a conjunction, Melech, Sedek. Sedek in Hebrew means righteous. There's a king over here, and his name is Adonazek, Zedek, and that means father of righteousness, Adonai. That's what the term means, or lord of righteousness. But Melchizedek is the the king, Melech, Melech, Melchizedek is the king of Jerusalem or Salem at that time. And this is 1,900 years before Christ. Chronology is an important thing because you see David lived 900 years after Abraham did. And 900 years after Melchizedek had received tithes from Abraham, Jerusalem was still in the hands of the Gergesites. Yeah, they were still in the hands of them, the Jebusites, rather. All the 40 years that Saul, the first king of Israel, served, his, 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 uh, his capital was never Jerusalem. It was Gibeah. And the reason it wasn't Jerusalem is because the Jebusite was still in Jerusalem. They were a problem, a thorn in the flesh. And so uh, it took the, uh, it took, uh, guess which king? I'll let, let you guess tonight. Of all the kings of Israel, which one do you think was responsible for kicking the Jebusites out yeah. and taking Jerusalem? Well, it didn't take long to answer that, did it? No. Absolutely not. Do you know why? From all before him and all since him, there was on one David. There was not two Davids, just one. And he was the only king that Israel ever had that was able to gather all the 12 tribes together and they acknowledged him as their king. The only one, the only one could keep them all together. So in the book of Exodus, chapter number three and verse 17, and I have said, I will bring you out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites unto a land flowing with milk and honey. So what happens is the Canaanite goes before Abraham because in Genesis chapter number 12, the Bible says when Abraham in 1900 B.C. came out of Ur of the Chaldees. He went into the land of Israel, and the Bible said the Canaanite was then in the land. So what happens? Well, at the plains of Shinar, when the ark landed on top of Ararat, 
these Canaanites went straight into the promised land. It was not their land. It was never promised to them. But they were usurpers in that land. And that's where they went. And it took the power of God to drive them out. And so when we come to this issue of Jerusalem, we find out that it's always been a hot spot on earth. And it still is. Jerusalem is very important to what's happening in this world. If someone were to blow up the Dome of the Rock or the Mosque of Omar, as it's called, if they, someone blew that up, let's say some Jew or some terrorist or someone, you have never seen the kind of emotion and anger that would rise up over that immediately. And the fingers would begin to point and people would be blamed. And this, of course, could very easily start World War III. And so, therefore, it's very important to understand that even now, even now, uh, what are we looking at? 3,000, 3,023 years since David took that city. 3,023 years later, it is still the hottest spot on the face of this earth. And that's Jerusalem. So it's important. It's important to understand this because we understand it and there's a message to be said about it. And I want to try to give that out to you tonight. It says in 2 Samuel chapter number 5, in Hebron, David, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, or Jerusalem. now what does Jerusalem mean? That's the way they say it, by the way. The, around here they say Jerusalem, but that's not the way it's pronounced. It's Jerusalem, and it means the city of peace. Okay, the city of peace. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 30 and 3 years over all Israel and Judah. The king and his men went to Jerusalem and to the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, now watch this, except you take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither. What, what does that mean? That means until you are taking our lame, our blind, all of those who cannot uh, uh, defend for themselves or work for themselves, you take them, you're not going to come inside the walls of this city. Here's what David said. Except you take them away. You cannot. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, Zion, the same as the city of David. And it was called the city of David even to this day. He took it by force. It was not given to him. This is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ coming at his second advent when he comes on a white horse and he has a sword proceeding forth from his mouth. He comes as king of kings and lord of lords. He doesn't come as an intercessor anymore. He comes as a war, a man of war. And he will literally take from this earth what rightfully belongs to him. So there's great typology in this. The temple they wanted to build. God told them to build a tabernacle, which was a movable thing. And they moved it for 40 years in the wilderness. And the tabernacle is where they worshiped God. The tabernacle is a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing. But then they got to the Holy Land. They wanted to build a temple. And God said to them, I never told you to build a temple. The Lord your God does not dwell in buildings made by men's hands. That was the issue. You cannot build a dwelling place for me. And that's true. I mean, when the Bible says that uh, our Father, which art in heaven, he's not in heaven for himself. When the Almighty was living eternally in the past, there was no heaven. <laughs> you understand? There was a time when there was nothing, not even atoms, to form anything. He has never needed anything to exist. This is why he says, I am that I am. I am the self-existing one. But we find in Jerusalem a great truth because that's where the Temple of Solomon was built. And God overruled his own purpose and and succumbed at the time to their, to their purpose, for they wanted to build him a temple. And he anointed it, he blessed it, and he sent the Holy Spirit into it, and it drove them out, and they couldn't stay because of the glory of God. And so the temple of God became a magnificent thing on top of Moriah. And it stood like that until 586 B.C. And in 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple, tore it down and carried off uh, much of the, uh, of, the, of the value of the land. And, uh, and, and it was that way until the second temple was built 
And that second temple was erected during the time of uh, Herod, who under Zerubbabel started it, and Herod finished it and embellished it, and that was the second temple. And that's all they've had. They're looking for the third temple. Now, I want to talk about the temple tonight, and the first thing I want to say about the temple is the place that it was built. And it was built at a place that is called the place of peace. All right? Peace. You can't make peace with one who hasn't made peace with you. Right. You need to understand, it's not up to you to make peace with a warring God. Amen. You hear a lot of that garbage preached. That garbage is, garbage is coming from the pulpits today. Right. God's not at war with you. No, he has already made peace. Yes. God was in Christ yes. reconciling the world to himself. So what does he expect us to do? Accept the peace that he's made. That's what we do. We accept that peace. And by doing that, he has extended the olive branch. He always makes the first move. It was the Lord who came in the cool of the day to walk with Adam, yeah. who was hiding himself now, hiding himself from the Lord. Keep that in mind. If God be for you, who can be against you? You don't have to run from him. No. You never had a greater friend than him. No. In the book of Genesis, chapter number 22, and verse number 2, it says this. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee in the land of Moriah. Now that word Moriah is a Hebrew word, and it means where God is seen, or God can be seen, but it has a triple meaning. It also means where God sees. So Moriah is a place where there's a lot of light shed. And the truth of the matter is, the, the place with the most light on the face of this earth is the cross of Christ. Yeah. Amen. Because men who live in darkness and walk in darkness and love darkness run from the cross. But those of you who love the Lord and walk in the light, as he is in the light, you embrace the cross. Amen. You do that because that's a place where the light of, sh of God truly shines. So therefore, it's a manifestation of the Almighty. In the book of Genesis, chapter number 22 and verse number 12, it says this about Moriah. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad. Neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. This is where the father did not spare his only son. You see, in the mind of God, when the mind of Abraham was ready to do it, that was good enough. This is a principle that is to this day. You may not be physically capable. I had a man come to me one time 30 years ago, and he said, God's called me to be a missionary in such and such a place. I said, we're going to pray for you, that God uses you. But something came up in his life that made it totally impossible for him to go. But he said, I've talked to God. And God says, that's all right, son. The fact that you were willing to go and there was no argument from you, that's all he wanted. You see that? That's what's important tonight. Willing, if you're willing. Yeah. And so it is. He spared not his own son. Abraham offered him up in his mind. As far as Abraham was concerned, Isaac was in the hands of God, and it was over. The Bible said in Romans chapter number 8 and verse 32, He that spared not his own son. Now, why does it say it like that? It says it like that because the Lord Jesus Christ is worth more than all of heaven. There's no city of gold, walls of jasper, gates of pearl, that it has the value of the Son of God. He is, the, he, he is heaven's jewel. He is the most important one of all the ones that have ever lived. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. We have our meaning because of him. We have our identity because of him. We are who we are because of him. And there's nowhere else to go but him. So he spared not his own son. Where was this? This is where they built the temple. In the book of 1 Chronicles, chapter number 21 and verse 15. You have a remarkable thing. And a lot of you that read your Bible, you know what's going on here. God sent an angel into Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying, the Lord beheld, and he repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed, now watch these words, it is enough. It is enough. Stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan, Ornan the Jebusite. Now even though they had taken the town, away from the Jebusites and had driven them out of their stronghold. David allowed this man to retain possession, ownership of his threshing floor. And where was his threshing floor? 
His threshing floor was right smack in top of Moriah. Yes. Now, you remember not too long ago, I brought you a little message about threshing floors in the Bible. There's a beautiful story of a threshing floor in the book of Ruth right. when she lies at the feet of Boaz. There's quite, a, there's quite a thing there. Threshing floor is where separation takes place. Separation takes place. And the thing that does the work of separation in a threshing floor is the wind. And the wind is a type of the Holy Spirit of God. If you want to know, if you want to, see, if you want to watch God make a distinction between people and separate, how does he do it? He does it by the Spirit of God. I hate it for those that weren't here Sunday morning. We had a meeting. The Holy Ghost moved into this place. He hadn't been in here like that in quite some time. He hadn't been here in quite some time. But the power of God began to move, and I could see it moving. And uh, I won't say a whole lot about what happened there that morning, but I could also sense another spirit. And uh, it was a hindering spirit. And I think it manifested itself. And, uh, and, but, uh, uh, you know, we'll leave that up to God. But the Spirit of God moved in this house. Yes. And how many of you were here Sunday morning? And did you sense a presence? Well, let me tell you something. The folks that watch this on YouTube, all you got to do is get on there and read some of their statements. They did too. And they weren't even in here. But they knew that there was a presence in this house. Yes. Now, folks, that's our strength. Yes. They may have 100,000 over here on the river watching a ball game, but they don't have that presence. They have, a, they have a mosh pit in some of these big theater churches around the country, and they get worked into a frenzy, and their music and their lights beating, but they don't have that presence. That presence is the presence of God, the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so that wind, you remember when it came in the book of Acts chapter number 2? The wind came down. You remember when the Lord said and in, the book of, uh, in the book of John chapter number 20, breathed on them? And said, receive you the Holy Ghost. Yes. There's breathing and wind that's attached to man in such a way that it's not anything else. But in any event, the, uh, he said it's enough. So what does that mean? That means that when God looked down on Calvary, on the top of Moriah, yes. and his son gave up the ghost, God said, it's enough. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. You see, God saw everything there was to see about the Lord Jesus Christ. He not only saw the physical suffering, he saw the spiritual suffering. He saw it all. He saw every bit of it. And he's the only one that can read your title clear from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. He knows what make you tick, makes you tick if you don't know what makes you tick. And the truth of the matter is, David, smart man, said, Try me, O Lord, and search me and see if there be any wicked way in me. I had much rather have the Holy Spirit search my heart and try it than try to do it myself. For the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I can't do it. I can't do it. We get, we, we get to where we get arrogant sometimes. And uh, I heard a man say the other day, he said, if you're sinning, you're not a Christian. That's sad, folks. I mean, he, 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 I believe he was serious when he said that. That's sad. That really is. That's sad because he, ha he has never really taken in 1 John chapter number 7, 8, and 9. 10. Never taking it in. In the book of 1 Chronicles, Chronicles 21, 15, it's enough. John 19, 30 said, and when Jesus therefore received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. Yes. Finished. It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. That word translated finished is the word teleo. Yeah, I'm sure you've heard it before. But let me give you the lexicon definition of what it means. Finished. Teleo. That's the Greek word. To make an end or to accomplish, to complete something, not merely to end it, but to bring it to perfection. It doesn't mean it's, it's just over. No, it has been perfected. And it, in, in my book, is one of the worst sins and probably the worst sin that you'll ever commit in your life is to, I don't care how well-meaning you are, is to try to add something to the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on that cross. I've got no time for that. No, no, no. So I don't, care how, I don't care how big you are in your church and how well you mean. When you try to add to what he's done at the cross, what you are doing by adding is to diminish. And you're saying that the sacrifice of Christ was not enough and so forth. And there, I don't doubt it. I don't think there's anybody in this house and probably nobody watching us that believes that. So 
the, the Temple Mount in First Chronicles chapter number 21, verse 27. And the Lord commanded the angel, and he put up his sword again into the sheath thereof. You see, this is where he not only finished the work, the sword was put up. Yeah. See? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's put up. The sword. Listen to this. The sheath. The sword was, was put into a sheath in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7. If you want to turn there, just make a note of it. Read it when you get home. I want you to look at the way the Bible mentions this. He comes at it from a different angle. In Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7, Awake, O sword. This is the Holy One speaking now. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd. Who's his shepherd? Who's Jehovah's shepherd? The Lord Jesus. You know why it's important to get the shepherd right in Zechariah? Because the idle shepherd is mentioned in Zechariah. Idle, yeah. Not I-D-L-E, but I-D-O-L. Turn there and read it. Is there a difference between I-D-L-E and I-D-O-L? Oh, yeah, our kids are learning. I hope they're learning it in school. I feel sorry for that when they ask out on the street to name one continent. She couldn't name one. I feel sorry for her. She's probably got a high school diploma that's not worth a dime. It's not worth a dime. If she doesn't, if she can't even name one continent. That's sad, isn't it? So what's the difference? Well, idle means that you're sitting there, essentially. Most folks, their brain's idle. Amen. <laughs> They need to get it in gear and fire it up. But I-D-O-L is something that you worship. Yeah. See, it's an idol. Yeah. So there's a shepherd that shows up in the book of Zechariah that's an idol shepherd. In other words, a counterfeit, a pseudo-Christos, a false Christ. And that's what John, is, Paul's talking about in, in, uh, in uh, First Thessalonians. He's talking about a, another Jesus, another Christ. So he says, now look at this. Think about this. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith Jehovah, the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. See that? God prophesied that the sword would fall upon his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is hanging on the tree, and it did. He gave himself, and man gave everything he could to destroy him. And and, of course, when they locked him in the grave, locked him, put a, I don't, I, I've, uh, I've been to the graveyard many times, but I haven't found too many locks on the tombs out there. But if they do put a lock on it, it's to keep people from raiding it, getting in. But you said they put a lock on that tomb because they wanted to keep his body in there. And all Herod would have had to do was to say, oh, you believe in this Galilean? Well, here's his body. Christianity would have died in its tracks. It would have died right there. Yes, he would. It would have. That would have been it. It would have been finished. I, uh, I don't know if I told you this or not, but it bears repeating. Graffiti has been with us ever since men have been on this earth. Graffiti. And uh, you can see these trains go by, and, you'll, and some of them are pretty good at it. <laughs> I mean, paint pictures on the side of it and so forth and so on. And you'll find it. I found graffiti in the pyramid, the Great Pyramid in Egypt, graffiti. They have found graffiti that was written by a Roman soldier probably in the first century after Christ. Now watch this. Graffiti by a Roman soldier in the first century after Christ of a man hanging on a cross. And he's mocking him and making fun of him and said, Is this your God? He's hanging here dead. Now, you know why that's important? There's a bunch of people out there who really do believe that there never was a Christ and there never was a crucifixion. And the, and the evidence is becoming overwhelming. It's becoming overwhelming. You date something the first century after Christ with somebody hanging on the cross and this man mocking and making fun of him about him being your God. What would you think that'd be? Well, of course it is. And the first century after Christ, folks, is all the way up to, to 100 A.D. That's the first century. In plain words, Christ lived in the first century. So uh, here we are with physical evidence that he was here. So he said, O sword against my shepherd. 
This place at Moriah, Temple Mount, is where the corn was threshed. Second Chronicles 3, 1 Chronicles 3.1 Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem and Mount Moriah, where the Lord appeared to David his father in the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. It is a place where something is ground down. It's ground. Okay? You know, the, I talked about the stone this past Sunday. If you remember, I quoted a scripture about the stone Sunday morning where it said this is, the, this is a stone. This stone is cut out of a mountain. All right, now, all right, I told you there's a difference between a rock and a stone. All right? The stone is something cut from a rock. A rock is fixed. The rock stays where it belongs. There it is. It becomes a monument, whatever you want to use it for. But a stone is something movable. And so when the Bible says that this stone is going to smite this image on its feet, he's talking about the Gentile kingdoms, yeah. and it's going to smite it. And it's not going to gradually dissipate. It's going to overnight. It's going to be finished. Mm -hmm. Well, the Bible said if you fall on this stone, you'll be broken. Well, that's what happened to me. I fell on it. Praise be to God. Amen. I fell on it. It broke me. Yeah. And then he saved me. But he said, if that stone falls on you, it'll grind you to powder. See that? It will. It'll grind you to powder. So this is what's important about uh, this. The corn was threshed at the top of Moriah. I've been there. I've been to Jerusalem. I've been to, every time I go to Holy Land, I've been to Jerusalem. I think I've been six times over there. I can't remember now. Five or six. I led one tour and went over to Brother Bevington four or five times. Brother Bevington loved the Holy Land. My goodness, he'd been there 50 times or more, and he knew the place. If anybody knew the Holy Land, uh, Bob Bevington knew it. He's a good man, and I miss him. He's with the Lord now, but he had a, always had a good tour. But the end of our tour would always be Jerusalem. We'd start everywhere else, and then we'd come there because that spot right there essentially was, uh, I guess you might say, the crowning achievement, the most important part. And I'll tell you what, I have uh, very few places on this earth that really, what you might call, take your breath away, but that one will. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like Jerusalem. There's not another Jerusalem on the face of this earth. It's, not, it's on a mountain. And there are mountains around it, but it's just a big hill around here. You know, they don't have any real big mountains. And the Jordan River, we've got creeks that big, <laughs> just about, sure. It's no Mississippi or, or, or Amazon or Nile or any river like that. But there's, there's something about this place that's different. There's a spirit there. Now, if you get into, if you get into a place like that, it, uh, you'll never forget it. I was in Jerusalem, and we stayed that night in a hotel on the Mount of Olives. I think it's called the seven arches, the five arches, seven arches. You've been over there, Brother McDonald. You know what it's called. Mount Scopus, well, Mount Scopus is where the hotel was. Okay. But it's right there. It's next to uh, Mount of Olives. So we stayed there. And about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, I had uh, a, a, an encounter with a demon like I had never had in my life. I just woke up, and all of a sudden, I was fighting for my very existence. I was in battle. And I had never fought a, a, life, a fight like that. This thing was trying to kill me. So what would you do? I went to God. That's what I did. I began to plead the blood. And I spoke directly to it. And I said, you don't, I don't belong to you. You have no authority or power over me. In the name of Jesus Christ, I break your power. In the name of Jesus Christ, I belong to him. And if I didn't belong to him, you'd know it right now. And I belong to him. And this thing began to back off. But I'll never forget the hair stood up on the back of my neck. And it was an encounter like I never had in my life, a personal encounter with a demon. And then we got to LaGuardia in New York City. Our plane was grounded. It was canceled. The flight was canceled. And there we were. And we couldn't go anywhere uh, by air until they created another flight or something. So there we sat. I sat there all night long. And the next morning, I got a flight to Cincinnati, from Cincinnati into Knoxville. And then that morning, I got into Knoxville. I don't know what time it was, sometime that night. And the following morning, I got up and went on the back porch right up here. 
And to contrast the two, I can't use words, but I do believe that that wicked, vile thing must have known. God might have let it know, or somehow or another, it might have known what was about to happen to me on that back porch. Because what happened to me on that back porch was just as much, it was just as much in greatness and height and blessedness as that confrontation with the demon was in the pit because God came on me like he had never come on me and he completely changed my ministry. He didn't save me, didn't re-save me, I was already saved. But he gave me, a, he gave me, he gave the Holy Spirit a, a move upon me that I had never had happen. And then I sat down on the swing and things began to flood my soul. And I'm talking three o'clock in the morning and it just flooded and flooded. And the messages and the power of the Holy Spirit of God saying this has to happen before that can happen. This has to happen before that can happen. He began to teach me and train me and instruct me and fill me as I sat on that porch, back porch experience. I'll never forget it. I can show you the very spot right up here on this house where I had that happen to me. And that was something, folks. And I hope you have something like that happen to you. It may not be the same thing I had. But what's, who am I? Who am I? That's what David said when God chose him. He said, who am I to lead thy people? Who am I? Well, who am I? I'm no different or no better than you. The Bible says you'll find me if you search with me with all your heart. If you really want that power, the Holy Spirit of God, to come on you, if you're, if you're in full of doubt, let's say tonight that Satan's he sifted you and he's about to destroy your faith, and, uh, you know, the world can, believe me. Christians can. And destroy your faith, destroy your joy, take it away, and you walk with God. Uh, get away from the people. Get away from them, even, even the well-meaning ones, even your best friends. Say, I just got to get away from you for a while and get alone with God. Get alone with him. I love to sit out there on that porch at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning at home. Not this one, but at home. You'll see me. I'll be praying at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning. I'll be there listening when the birds start singing. A lot of times I'll be sitting there. When You, you, ever, notice the, you ever notice the sound of the woods? I don't care if you listen to this or not. But at night, before, finally before it gets dark, you hear these, these things squeaking and the, you know, whatever, whatever they are, they're rubbing their legs together. You hear there's no birds singing. All you hear is that. How many know what I'm talking about? And then the next morning, you don't hear these. But the birds start singing. Yeah, yeah the birds start singing. Well, I'm there both times. I'm there late at night listening to them, and I'm there in the morning before they ever come up, before they ever start. Because that's a good time to talk to God. before you ever turn on that boob tube with that meaningless, empty chatter that you get on channel 6, 10, and 26, this, me, well, how is your day? Well, what are you going to do? Tonight? Well, you know, it's wonderful. You know, I got my car this morning. I'll tell you the truth. I just couldn't imagine. It's not, and just nothing. Nothing. How many know what I'm talking about? Just go out there and get along with God. Talk to Him. Talk to Him. Before you turn on the the mindless, meaningless, empty chatter and talk to him and he'll talk back to you. And that'll do more for you. Five minutes of that will do more for you than about anything else I can think of. That's what, that's what it's about. He wants you to talk to him. Amen. And I know I'm ready for the funny farm because he talks back to me. Amen. Now God's my witness tonight. I fear him. Believe me, I fear him. Yeah. But he told me before service Sunday morning, he said, I'm going to do something Sunday morning. I said, all right, Lord. <laughs> and no argument yeah. out of me. And did he? Oh, yeah. He saved oh, a man yeah. right over here, and he moved in this house. Yes, he did. He told me he was going to do that. And I say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. I got this letter right here from Sean Eidelmeyer. This is, this, is, this is one of these things. That brother, he warms my heart. He's a good man. He sent this photograph. He's, he's, uh, he's one of our missionaries in Haiti. We support probably 30. Uh, Sister uh, uh, Hayworth keeps up with it, Sandra. I know we support at least 30. And this is one of our missionaries right here. Okay, and he's with these kids down here. And they love him. And he loves them. And he's established himself. Now here's what he said. He wrote this letter. And he wrote it, uh, let me see if I can find it. 
Surely I have lost that letter. It's important because it tells you how God does things. Uh, so, okay, here it is. Good morning, Edna. Will you please tell Pastor Lawson we thank you so very much for the extra support money he sent us. It is a huge blessing and an answer to prayer. With school tuition cost higher this coming year, moving into a larger rental home, and wanting to help some other families as well, I had just prayed this morning and asked the Lord if it was his will, if he could send us an extra $500 to $1,000 this week to help with everything. So when my mom sent me the photo of the check from the pastor, I was in tears of joy, praising the Lord for his faithfulness. Please let pastor know how much of a blessing and encouragement he and the church are to me and the boys I shared with them today how the Lord had answered our prayers once again. He quotes Ephesians chapter number 3, verse number 20. Well, we can't send anything out, out unless you send it in. You have a direct part in anything like that. And this brother right here is so thankful. There's one thing that characterizes this brother right here. You do anything for him, he goes out of his way to thank you, congregation, in here for what's been done. And I'm going to tell you something. One of the things that God, through the Apostle Paul, condemns the final generation for is unthankful. We've had preachers come through here that we give good love offerings to. One wrote back the other day and said to us, he said, I've been in the ministry for 20, 30 years. He wrote this back to us. He said, I've been in the ministry for 30 years. He said, I have never received a love offering like I got at Temple Baptist Church. Greatest offering I have ever received. That's what he said. And we help him on his way. He's a good man. But there are preachers that come through here that never give one word of thanks for what's been done for them. There's a problem. That's one of the measures of your spirituality is if you have a thankful heart. And I thank you tonight for what you've done for me. And I thank the Lord for where he brought me from. Amen. And that's why I could minister to people who are just, just old plain sinners. Amen. Say, are sinners welcomed in your church at Temple Baptist Church on Woodrow Drive, preacher? Are sinners welcome here? Amen. How many agree with me? Sinners are welcome. Yeah, come in and join the crowd. <laughs> Amen. But we're not up here condoning anything. We're preaching the grace of God. That's, what the, that's where the difference lies. You come here and you can find peace with God. You can get your sins forgiven, but learn how to walk in faith. And walk in the light. That's what's so important. And that's the responsibility of the church is to teach that. Not to teach people that they can live above sin. That's garbage. You're living in la-la land. But to teach them how to live and walk with, uh, walk with the Lord in fellowship. So pray for Sean because I worry about him. Hades in a mess. And he, and he I mean, he's, he's right down there, right smack in the middle of it. And he loves these people. And he loves what he's doing. And no doubt in my mind, he's where God wants him to be. He's doing what God wants him to do. All right, so please pray for him. It's good to have Sister Gillum back with us tonight. Amen. Has he been good to you since you had surgery? <laughs> All right, you're telling me you better straighten up, buddy. I mean, you need to be petted a little bit right about now when you have surgery. All right. Well, let's pray for it. Uh, Lucas, Lucas Hickman is with us tonight, and he had surgery today on his knee. And I just talked to him on the way over here, and I had no idea he'd be here. And so I'm glad he's here, though. That's good. Pray for Lucas. Yes, he had surgery today. He said they told him that he'd probably have to have surgery on his other knee. And he's awful young to be having surgery on his knees. Amen. So pray for him. And Brother Crane's mother passed away. And I think you told me that you'd be, you'd be doing the service uh, Friday. Okay. Okay. Barry Funeral Home South, one on the left right across the bridge there, going out Chapman Highway. Okay. Oh, Holly Hills, okay. 
Yeah, it's right before you get in that big curve going, okay, I know exactly what you're talking about. Okay, remember, it's family and prayer. All right, anybody else have requests tonight? Yes, ma'am. My goodness. Well, let's pray for her. I hate to hear that. All right, anybody else? All right. Amen. Okay, somebody else? Yes, ma'am? People love, act differently. They deal differently with chemo. Yeah, yeah. All right, anybody else? Yes, ma'am? Sure, yeah. Oh, yeah. Amen. All right. Somebody else? Yes, ma'am. Of course, that's, that's what they're going to teach. Yes. I mean, yeah. like I say, that Old Testament scripture, that's inspired of God. And when you get one that uh, lives by what that Old Testament teaches, he's living. Uh, there's a, uh, a, 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 a rabbi in Israel, well-known, big, big name rabbi in Israel, that has just recently said uh, the LGBTQ movement is a is a is a godless thing out of hell that is that's coming to destroy the home. Yeah. Now that's what he said. Where did he get that? He got it from the Old Testament. Leviticus 18, one place. Sure he did. Sure he did. Okay. More truth there than you get a lot in this place, in this country. Anybody else tonight? Yes, sir. That's got his attention, and he's, uh, he understands. That's good, though. It's such a shame that that soul lost her life, but God protected him, brought him through it, yes. All right, anybody else? Yes, ma'am. All right. Okay, yes, ma'am. Well, 
you remember what I said about meeting that demon in the Kidron Valley, right above the Kidron Valley, right above Gethsemane. You know, I was, I was close to all of that. And uh, plead the blood, tell that demon who you are. It doesn't own you. It has no authority over you. You're dealing with an intelligent being. Yes, you are. And you speak directly to it. That's always the best when you deal with a demon. Speak to it. Tell it who you are. It has no authority over you. Plead the power of the blood of Christ and what he's done for you. You can't be afraid of it. That's what intimidation is one of the, was one of the tools these things use. All right. Anybody else? Have I spoken to Quest tonight? Folks, if you'd like to come down here to the altar and pray, I'll pray with you. We'll talk to the Lord. One of the reasons that Satan attacks us, like this dear sister Miller's talking about here, is because God may be getting ready to do something. See, he may be getting ready to do something. Amen. Amen. Our Father, Lord, you know who I am. I don't have to tell you. You know my heart. My Father, you know my motivation. You know what I live for. You know what I do in my spare time. You know where I am, what I'm doing every moment of my life. Father, tonight I pray that you'd give me the wisdom I need to lead this church. Heavenly Father, as a pastor, as a bishop of this local assembly, you'd give me the wisdom for that. I need that, Lord. I need wisdom far more than I need zeal. And I need wisdom far more than I need anything else that I may consider to be. I need the wisdom of God and the filling of the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray for my brothers and my sisters that have come tonight. And they bow before you. Lord, you're the only one that knows all the hearts, all the burdens, all the problems. You have folks in here tonight probably or whose faith is beginning to falter. They've been through one battle after another battle and they can't see any light at the end of any tunnel. And they don't see a day that's going to come when they're going to be able to stand up and shout and sing victory again. They might have even been here Sunday morning, but it didn't do any really do anything for them. But they know what happened Sunday was real. I pray for them. They're no different from any of the rest of us. You want to bless them as much as any of us. It's not that we're greater because someone has, has the power of God moving on them. That's, not, that's a lie from hell. Every one of us need that power. We all need the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I pray for them. I pray for those that carry heavy burdens. Lord, help us to learn how to cast our care upon you if you care for us. Sometimes the words come easy, but the doing is hard. We don't know how to do it. How do we cast our care upon you? How do we do that, Lord? For those who have to do that, those that are burdened tonight with these problems, with these burdens, let the Holy Spirit, Father, guide them into the truth of what they need to know to do that. Lord, you've told us that in this world we'll have tribulation. But be of good cheer, you said that you've overcome the world. Thanks be unto God. You tell us that this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And we trust you. And Lord, I say as that man did in the Bible, I believe, Lord, but help thou my unbelief. I pray for them. There may be some in here tonight, they're sick, they're hurting. They've been hurting for some time. They've tried doctor after doctor after doctor. It's done them no good. Lord, I know you don't always heal. I know that. I know that. And I don't blame those that aren't healed for their lack of healing. I don't do that. That's in your hands. But my Heavenly Father, I know you do heal. I've seen you heal. And you can heal these tonight who call on your name. Heavenly Father, sometimes you let them get to the point where there's, no, there's nothing left. Nothing else they can do. They give up. And the only thing left for them is to turn to you and say, Lord, here I am, live or die. My life's in your hands. And it's at that moment that the power of God begins to work, Lord. I know I've seen that. I pray for them tonight. And I pray, Heavenly Father, for those that are praying for loved ones, lost family members, sons and daughters, husbands, wives. I have them in my family, Lord. We all, every family in this house tonight, I'm sure, has people in it that we're praying for. Lord, I pray for Temple. I pray for Temple Baptist Church. Oh, God, when the Holy Ghost wants to come into this house and move in our midst, let us be welcoming. Let us be hungry. Let us ask, Father, for give him a place in our soul. And, Lord, 
We can't live without you. You told us in John 15, without you we can do nothing. We can, we can accomplish a lot of busy work. We can even get the praise of man. But Lord, unless it's done by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, it's just dead works. I pray for your power. Pray for your presence. Pray for your blessing. Pray for your healing. Heavenly Father, be with us. We need you. We call on you. Oh God, we call on you. In your name I pray, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 If you've got time in the morning, if it's not pouring the rain, I don't know what's, what the weatherman's calling for. If you can get out there just a few minutes. Get out there before you get that TV on. And just spend a few minutes with God. Just a few minutes talking to him. A few minutes. And then if you got a little time, get in his word. Read the Bible. Yes. Ask him where he wants you to read. Yes. Ask him. Say, God, give me wisdom. Show me. Teach me. And sometimes you'll read a book of the Bible and you'll think, well, I've got that. Nobody's got it. Amen. You know why? Amen. It's alive. <laughs> In plain words, you read it today and there was nothing coming from it for you because you didn't need it today. But a month from now, go back to that same book and read that same scripture and it'll start coming because you need it then. It's the living word. So get back in the Bible. It's a wonderful book. And I have a book, I believe. I hope you do. I hope you don't have 15 lexicons in your Bible. And then when you try to read it, you go through here. Just read that book. There's power in that book. And it will speak to you. Amen. All right, let's stand up tonight and we'll have we'll have word prayer. Oh, that's right, I forgot. I forgot. Y'all go ahead and be seated for a moment. Uh, we need to come into business to do one thing tonight that needs to be done. And uh, it's just a, essentially a formality, but we need to do it. And uh, we'll have a motion that we're going to business. Motion's made. Motion seconded. Motion seconded. All right. We have, Jewel Martin has been the, the treasurer of this church for decades. Okay. But he passed away. And since then, Brenda Berry has essentially been the de facto treasurer. In other words, by doing the job, essentially she's been the treasurer of the church. What we'd like to do tonight is make it official. And uh, I've checked her out, and I haven't heard any bad talk on her or anything like that, so I, I think she might, she, she, she might uh, measure up. We'll ha who'd, who'd like to make a, a motion that we make her our, our treasurer? Motion's made. All right. Motion seconded. Those in favor show it with lifting the right hand. Uh, unanimous. Not a soul against you. Amen. All right. I trust her. I trust her with my life. I've known these two right here for decades. They've been friends. They're, they're good people. Amen. And uh, so you couldn't, you, couldn't, you couldn't have anybody you could trust more. You go to bed and sleep and not, not worry a bit about it. All right. So, uh, uh, Sister Barry, you're our, you're our treasurer now. Amen. You'll still be doing the same thing, but now you've got a title. Amen. All right. So if they come after you because of the money, <laughs> <we> <laughs> Uh, we wouldn't do that. All right. Good. Have a motion. We go out of business. Motion's made. We go out. Second. Those in favor show we lift in the right hand. Good. I'm glad. Did you know that Satan hates prayer meetings? He hates them, but he loves business meetings. Let's stand up and we'll have word prayer. That's the truth, folks. Dismiss us, BJ.